Can you just start by telling us who you are? Well, I was Derek Evans' assistant and then business partner for very nearly 50 years. So is there, do you know much about the history of how Derek came to set up the studio? Can you give us a little timeline of that? A potted history of Derek's long career, to be honest, was, is asking a great deal because, of course, the man started photographing his um, army chums in football teams and all the rest of it and then realised, you know, there was money to be made. This was, a, this was a particular hobby that he liked. He could make a career out of this. And he went through all the changes in technology in his 50 years ultimately being a nationally important television cameraman and with images recorded and saved in the National Photo Museum in Belgium. So it was an illustrious career from a very humble beginning. Can you tell us what, when you started working with Derek, how you got involved working with him and what it was like going there as a youngster? I started in 1962. Um, I had been adopted by the art tutor at um, the high school, uh, the, the late Harold Coates, who was very kind to me, and said one day, oh, Derek Evans needs an assistant, you ought to go along and have an interview. So one Saturday morning, I rolled up at Broad Street, climbed the 79 steps to the top, and there I met this fellow who was, um, he was very smartly dressed. He was a great, he was very, he was a dapper dresser was Derek. And uh, anyway, we talked for a few moments in the outer office and he said, come down then to my lower office. And there I just talked. And to be honest, it was the only serious interview for a job I had in my entire life. And I came away from there thinking, well, I've talked and that was, he was a nice chap and all the rest of it. Not remembering what I'd said. But nevertheless, a few days later, I got a letter in the post saying, you've got the job. So what was it like in those early days and what were, you, what, were your, what were you doing? Oh, frightening. Oh, it was frightening because, of course, I was a, a, a sort of simple country boy from a simple background. I was now at a studio with a very sophisticated man who was a man of the world uh, and a man who would um, easily move amongst um, politicians and heads of industry and other the good and the great. And I had to learn, for instance, just... Not, not, not my manners necessarily, but I had to learn as much about how to move amongst these people as I did to take a photograph. And remembering, of course, that I was not an amateur photographer before I went for an interview. So you learned everything from scratch? Absolutely from scratch. And Derek was, Derek was very generous in the way in which he allowed you to learn. For instance, he would send you out on an assignment and he would throw you in the deep end. Um, and if you made a mess of it, then he was always there to make the apologies or to put things straight with, it, straight with the clients. Very generous like that. But of course, it did mean that occasionally you did make an enormous uh, amount of uh, errors. I remember one famous occasion where Hereford United were playing, I, th I think it was a team, Oxford perhaps. Derek was suddenly ill and he sent me over there to film this for TWW as it was then. There were eight goals scored and I missed every one of them. <laughs> so that leads us on really say um so how important were the opportunities that Derek gave to people like you and to lots of other photographers that came oh they, they were enormously important Derek's the studio of course had this tremendous reputation it had a, it, it really did have a first class reputation for a freelance or stringer office and it meant that the studio was in fact a gateway for many people to careers in television or in, in newspapers and of course, some of the um, uh, young uh, assistants that he had did move on into television and became um, very, very competent um, uh, television cameramen. Do we want names named as such? Or? Yeah, can you give us some examples of people who went through the studio and what they hmm. did? Over the years, of course, um, there, there were a few assistants who didn't quite make the grade. But um, some of them um, did, did, did move on very, uh, to very successful careers. Uh, Mike Charity moved from Hereford, as I joined Derek in 1962, and became a, a freelance cameraman there for um, Central Television. Uh, Mike had the dubious distinction of being the longest serving journalist, or photojournalist, sorry, on the Freddie West case at Cromwell Street, and, and subsequently wrote a book about his experiences. 
Uh, Rick Calder left and became the cameraman at TWW before becoming the senior cameraman at Border Television and then moving into BBC. And of course, uh, uh, Graham Essenhigh was our last assistant and Graham left us to actually work at Central Television as a freelance cameraman. I'm, sure, well, first, there, I'm sure there wasn't anything such as a typical day, but just to give us a bit of a flavour of what it was like working in, in this studio and what was your what was a typical day involved? I, I, I can't think for one minute that it was ever a typical day. Uh, it, it was always quite different. And of course, apart from the newspaper work and the television work, there was the industrial work as well that we did. And um, we worked principally for Bulmers, for um, Painter Brothers when they had the big uh, pylons doing, uh, Henry Wiggin, and, and a, a multitude of small companies. So there was never really a typical day. You would have what we call diary engagements where you could actually anticipate that you would be doing such and such. Uh, take, for instance, the opening of the Greyfriars Bridge in Hereford. Well, you knew this was coming on. And then you could say to the Central Television and indeed to HTV, we're opening a new bridge. Do you want some film of that? so you would know what was on that day. Other days, of course, there might suddenly be an emergency. Uh, I can remember, for instance, during the days of Kyo Evans and the um, Welsh nationalists, when they tried to blow up the water supply from Birmingham to, uh, from, sorry, from the Eland Valley to Birmingham. And so all of a sudden we had to dash up there and there was this great big hole in the, in the ground there and where the water had escaped and all the rest of it. So you, you never had a typical day. How many people would there have been working in the studio at any one time? Where was the biggest kind of workforce? Uh, there were three and a half, because we had a, a lady who, who was extremely good at doing the accounts and took the tedium of the accounts in our, off our hands. And then, of course, there was Derek, myself, and another assistant. And there was a lot of work. Certainly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, right through to the 90s, the studio had a queue of work every day. And it would be not be unusual for one of us to work 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week to keep pace with it all. We were on the top floor of number 43 Broad Street, which was above the Halifax Building Society in those days. And immediately below us was the Women's, Federation of Women's Institute and then there were some insurance offices. But there were 79 steps, I think it was, to the top, because in foolish mo moments, of course, at lunchtime, um, we would challenge each other for a race to see who would get up the, up the fastest and that sort of thing. But you went into this um, under the eaves studio and on the landing at the top there were a number of exhibition pictures there and then you went into the, a small corridor. On the left was the dark room and on the right was the general office. Now the general office was where all the fun took place and there was a lot of fun in this business and of course a lot of smoking which meant that the most junior member of the staff, every spring, had to get a bucket of water and some uh, fairy liquid or something and wash down the ceiling for the nicotines that came off the ceiling. And there were, uh, everybody smoked in those days. And then, of course, there was the small dark room, which tended to be very hot on summer days, but was always very, very busy. We had a studio and then another private office for Derek of his own. I mean, you've sort of touched on this a bit, really, but how was sort of the studio and Derek kind of viewed within the county? Was he kind of like the, the eminent photography studio of the... Oh, yes. Der uh, the studio had a very good reputation. So within the community and within the county itself, of course, Derek was very widely known. Um, today, you talk of networking, but of course, in those days, we would talk about having contacts. And throughout the, the, the county and the region that we covered for television, um, in principal cities or principal towns, sorry, there would be a contact who would ring in with a story, there's a fire here or there's some, such and such a thing that happened. Um, one in particular I remember, because I, I, I thought the name was quite glorious, there was a fellow in Landridnod Wells who was our contact and he would ring in with saying um, there's going to be sporting events this weekend and he was the manager of the Automobile Palace at Willandred and Wells, which I always thought was a glorious name. Then, of course, there were things. There, there was like a, a journalist, uh, Bob Jenkins at Bromyard. So all these people became satellites of our own particular studio. And, of course, they then spread the name. Do you know if there's so-and-so? Because I have a story for Derek Evans. And I think that's how the network grew 
that gave Derek and the studio the reputation that it had. And how did that transfer into sort of his national and international career? I think it, 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 it obviously moved from being a local to a regional to a national and possibly an international reputation, not necessarily by intent or design, but almost by accident. One of the things that Derek would be would teach us all actually was if you were on an assignment and you saw another little picture which you thought that's a quirky little picture could be useful you took the other little picture and then of course that little picture might then become a, 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 a magazine article or something like that and particularly Derek's pictures then were published widely in France and so it was really just a case of this thing growing organically rather than um, setting out with the idea that you were going to get yourself an international reputation. So I was quite interested that thing you said about he always sort of said, don't just concentrate on the picture you've gone there for, look around, what else is there? So, I mean, he's obviously had a very, very good eye for photographing people. That's kind of what's comes out from his photographs and he's a real people person how did he kind of build up that rapport and how did he kind of get such nice photographs of people well, well Derek had an easy rapport with people um I mean if you met Derek you know um at an, at an event um he was a, never a man you would consider to be a threat to you in any way he was an easy charming man um and in fact, I can remember one or two places that I went to where Derek would walk into a room and being in a splendidly good mood for the day would absolutely take over the whole room and he would lift the spirits of everybody there and everybody then would have a jolly good time. Um, he was that type of guy. And of course, that was reflected really in his pictures. He, he wanted to see people um, doing well in life, enjoying life and, and perhaps being amused by life. There were, there were a number of pictures, for instance, that he took of um, a very wizened little fellow in, in a Belgian market. He could have been a very slight man, but he was in charge of um, selling a huge collection of ladies' brassiers, which were called Buster Howders. And it was a very amusing picture, but that's the sort of thing that would appeal to Derek, of course. And what about, he's got quite a lot of photographs of children, hasn't he? He seemed to, you know, as well as with sort of people eating. So yes, but they, they were usually, the pictures of children that he had, they were, they were children reacting to things, weren't they? Particularly the gypsy children. And uh, I think Derek um, did find, of course the gypsy children were very attractive children anyway, big brown eyes, you know, and, um, uh, and all the rest of it. And, and they would be naturally photogenic for Derek. But of course, again, it was because these children were part of a wider scene in the community of hop picking and other things that he loved. So what, obviously, a lot of these things that he was filming, the sort of Herefordshire life, were probably, I'm guessing, not commissioned work. Were they things that he did as just out of interest? or? I think uh, not quite out of interest. For instance, um, way back in the 1950s, Derek would find um, uh, perhaps a seasonal thing even the Mayfair, or again going back to the hop picking, um, would produce a, a, a splendid picture that would be attracted to a picture editor who didn't want to publish any hard news. But he had a little space to fill and he wanted something nice in there. So Derek would find this picture. Of course, having found publications in the late 1950s for, say, perhaps the Mayfair annually or the hop picking, every year when the season came round, it would be time to try the market again. And so that's how the, the, the whole thing came came about. And what about his love for Hereford United? Then, when we're going through the day books, it's all Hereford United, Hereford United. Absolutely, instead. absolutely. I mean to say, Derek, Derek was a people person. Derek loved people. He wanted to be with people and couldn't bear to be alone. I mean to say, to put Derek in the middle of a, a farmer's field with buttercups and daisies and say, look how beautiful this is, uh, that would horrify Derek. But put him on the touchline by Hereford United where there were people there shouting and bawling and saying, come on, United. Oh, that's where he wanted to be. Absolutely. transition from photography into yes or? there was a transition of course from still photography to cine uh, to, to cine, cine for television um, but of course that, that was just naturally occurred because uh, the late 1950s early 60s um, there was the advent of commercial television 
those of us old enough as, me, as I am to remember it, you know, it was quite a limited actual um, transmission. But nevertheless, there was a market. And it was a market with an insatiable appetite for material. And Derek had all the cunning and had all the skills and all the contacts to know what was going on in his particular patch. And when I say a particular patch, I do mean there was a patch because, of course, the filming which was done for independent television in those days was largely um, governed by the um, television trade union. And um, so that there were not too many people sort of flooding the market and, and offering um, film, we were each allocated a patch. There was Derek Evans in Hereford, John Cullen at um, Merthyr Tidville, Frank Bevan at Swansea, uh, and a chap up Rill whose name I forget. And you were given a certain patch of land to look after. It was Herefordshire and um, into Montgomeryshire, Radnorshire and all the rest of it. So there was a market. Derek was able to do it. And he had all the skills and the knowledge because he'd worked in the newspaper industry, of course. And he just blossomed. And I think the 70s and the 80s, the studio would have been 80% at least relying on its income to come from television work. And on the news, it was all news. Not all news, some of it would have been sport. Um, and occasionally the, um, we were sent to the Nationalised Steadford at um, uh, Newtown, Montgomeryshire, or we were sent to the International at Clangothlan, or we would be other cameramen to help out at the Royal Welsh Show. And then you would work alongside other cameramen, of course. I, I don't think you can say that it's just a simple package of, a, uh, of something around Derek because um, with Derek it was the entire package. It was Derek, the studio, the work um, and, and all the little bolt-on extras that go with it because at the end of the day all of us who worked in that studio would say one thing at the end of it. It was all great fun, absolute fun to work there. So do you want to um, just talk the sort of the changes in photography that's gone on since the when you first started, just the kind of the challenges of keeping up with the changes in technology? <laughs> um, I think we would all readily recognise that photography has probably changed more than any other industry. Um, and when I started with Derek, it was absolutely a skill to take a black and white photograph in the middle of winter because of course there were so many variations on the equipment on the film the processing the light conditions and everything else whereas today everything of course is totally automated and Derek steered the studio admirably through a lot of technical change I can well remember for instance when um, the studio first of all uh, sorry the television studios first of all changed to working in um, colour and you then had to film in colour transparency stock which was very difficult and you had to be very accurate with it well a lot of, lot of the freelancers and even some of the senior cameramen were finding it very difficult because they ever only ever worked with black and white we had worked for colour transparencies for other other sections of industry and all the rest of it we knew the difficulties of it so we moved quite seamlessly actually into working um, onto colour transparency stock and because we moved easily into it, of course, we were fed more and more work because we could simply do the job. Then the next thing that came along, of course, was the change to video. And I well remember the changes to video because Derek and I would sometimes go to the International Photo Fair in Cologne and you would see this fledgling um, equipment there. And all the old guys were saying, it'll never catch on. Every time it rains, these cameras don't work. It'll never catch on. And of course, here we are today. And what about this change into digital? Did, did Derek get involved with digital? No, he didn't, funny enough. I think Derek had um, just about come to the end of his working life and his health was falling apart. So he, wasn't, uh, he didn't really get involved in digital working at all. But I, I think, to be honest, he would have done. I think there's no doubt about it. The only thing is, he'd have probably picked up the camera, taken all his pictures and then handed over the proceeds to somebody else. I mean, putting it through a computer. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about why he was particularly drawn to the Mayfair and did he 
know. Did he you film know? it every year? Did he film it every year or did he just go a couple of times? Or... Um, the Mayfair was always an early appointment in the diary. You always knew it and you could tell a couple of weeks in, oh yes, the Mayfair, we've got to do some pictures of the Mayfair. What arrangements were we making? And of course, um, one of the more usable pictures was usually a picture of Hightown taken from one of the upstairs windows of perhaps Lloyd's Bank. So of course, the first thing you had to do was go down to Lloyd's Bank and say, seven o'clock on Tuesday evening, can we come into your window and all the rest of it. But apart from that, Derek had actually found many pictures previously that were very amusing uh, and certainly showed a, a flavour of the uh, of the Mayfair. And of course, so you always went back thinking, we might find those sort of pictures again. Um, and in fact, when I look today, though, at um, pictures of the Mayfair, it's inevitably people putting a picture, uh, putting a camera on a tripod and taking a picture of, say, the big wheel whirling round and round and round. It's seldom looking at the fun that the people are having. Mm. Again, very, very good very, point. Again, yeah. he was mm. very much looking for the people, wasn't mm. he, in the picture, mm. definitely. Um, so what about the hot picking then? How did that come about? I can't remember much about the hop picking, to be honest. Um, I think the hop picking was dying out very largely just after I started working with Derek. Um, I do remember we went out into the fields once or twice to take some pictures, but it seemed to me by then the, the great gangs of gypsy workers had gone, and this was now getting mechanised, and this was getting uh, into people who were not, not necessarily professional people, but they were people, they were tradespeople who knew exactly how to handle the hops and all the rest of it. So I think the, the great character of the hop, yeah, hop fields had gone by the time I saw, or, um, by the time I worked with Derek. Can you talk a bit more about his involvement with Hereford Hills? Yeah, well, Derek um, was always... Um, a great supporter of football teams and in fact he played briefly for Shrewsbury Town and famously told me one day that at the end of each game he used to find 10 shillings put into his football boots and of course he loved Hereford United and had a, a huge association with them over a very long period of time um, particularly when Len Weston of the Cider Factory when uh, Len was the chairman there um, and uh, Len and Derek Evans of course were great chums and every time there was a cup run, that meant there was going to be fun at the studio and out at Much Markle, because inevitably it would involve going out to Much Markle when they were listening on the radio to the draw for the next round of the FA Cup and all the rest of it. And Len would then have to bring out some of his best cider and they'd have to swap stories and it was fun all round. Pictures of the found oak flower walk as well. Yes. Was that a personal interest? Do you have a link with the No, just, just a, it's a wonderful photo opportunity even today, isn't it? What could be better than an old English village and all the folks come out and they put flowers on a stave and they process through the, uh, through the village? Uh, just a fabulous picture opportunity. I think I, I have told you before there was one picture of this one elderly gentleman there. And he looks particularly parched. He's got his lips apart there. And he's holding a stave there. Um, apparently, part of the um, ceremony is, or the, the procession is, that they call it the village doctor and they give him a pint. Perhaps the chap was waiting for a pint. Uh, but Derek then sold the pictures to the chocolate magazine, which said, and suddenly you feel like an arrow. Which was the way in which Derek worked, you see. He would have a good picture and he'd think, how can I sell that? I, it's, it's difficult now to give somebody a summary of just how different things were back when I started in the, 60s, in the 1960s at the studio because the little studio was a microcosm of everything that went on in Hereford. I mean, you say there was a gossip, there was fun, there was information coming backwards and forwards and there were a lot of people who would just like to spend half an hour or an hour there catching up on various things and also to be part of it. Uh, there were a great number, for instance, of amateur photographers who would come in with an odd picture or just to, to discuss about doing something or other. Um, there were a number of um, retired journalists who would come in. There were a great number of um, reps, as we call it, travelling reps in those days who would come in. We would have one from uh, the, the film manufacturers Ilford, Kodak, May and Baker, the chemical people. And there was one famous gentleman, a major body, who was um, the space salesman, I think, for the Hereford Times or the Hereford Evening News, a retired military man. 
And again, great character, great fun. Come in with a bristling moustache and heavy tweed three-piece suit. And you would say, do you want a cup of coffee? And he'd say, yes. You'd give him a cup of coffee and out would come the hip flask and in would go a rather a generous quantity of brandy or whiskey. And then you would listen to his stories for an hour or two. There always seemed to be time for people like that. Always time. This is a really lovely example of Derek kind of capturing people and, you know, children especially. Can you just tell us a little bit about the photograph and how you might have gone about getting that shot? And become... This was part of a picture series that was taken at West Hope Court, you know, Wool Hope. Uh, there was a school there then for children who, uh, for deaf children. And um, there were a number of images, I think, as good as this one, to be honest. But it, it is a hallmark of how Derek worked, because he would have been quite unobtrusive in the room. And these children would have just been reacting to each other. They would have forgotten he was there. But Derek, nevertheless, would have waited for that ex precise moment when perhaps this child looked at this child Click, that's the picture. It, of course, it's the thing that Henry Cartier-Bresson used to call the something moment. Isn't decisive it? moment. The decisive moment, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, Derek was tremendous there. But of course, when you look at this sort of work, and when you saw Derek operating as, as we did as, um, as assistants, you then start to sort of copy that. You know that's a proven technique. You quietly sit there and just wait for that one moment and click, the shutter goes. One of the best people at this, to be honest, was his one assistant, Jennifer Bowen. Jennifer was tremendous. She would know exactly when to take the picture. But again, like Derek, she was never a threat to anybody there. She was a charming, easygoing person, so she would melt into the background. And then, of course, as soon as the, the picture presented itself, click, and that was it. As I say, apart from melting into the background, being unobtrusive so these children get to just move on with what they happen to be doing at the moment, um, and then choosing the decisive moment. There are other clues in this image, actually, as to quite how the photographer worked. There's quite a lot of grain you can see in the, in the picture, and that's because, of course, he would have used what was then a fairly high-speed film, probably HP3, an Ilford, a uh, British product, and that would have been 400 ASA. But I suspect this was taken on a Rolleiflex camera, indoors and the soft lighting you would have had an exposure of something like a 30th at 5.6 and working at a 30th of a second it means that any slight movement could it would actually blur so not only would you try and find the the high point of the picture activity in terms of expression but you would hopefully do it when somebody wasn't vigorously moving their hand or vigorously moving their head otherwise you would get a blurred image and then of course the other thing is to think well, you know, you've got fairly soft lighting, it's fairly low lighting. What would you do when you took the film back to the studio? Would you actually give it a little bit more um, processing time in the developer to increase the um, contrast in the picture? But if you did that, you would have to be very careful that you then didn't darken all these shadow areas too much. If you did darken them too much, you would have a small circular disc of card on the end of a piece of wire and as you projected this image in the enlarger down onto this piece of paper prior to developing it you would actually wave a small piece of um, card round and round on the face here and just hold the light back for a few moments that was called dodging an area of a print and if for instance there was a starved white area here you would burn in the print by giving it a little bit more exposure. But this is all an intuitive thing. This was nothing that you could actually be necessarily taught academically to do. Um, another aspect of Derek's life, of course, was he was a, a leading liberal. Uh, he was a liberal all his life and eventually the president of Hereford Liberal Association. He was... Um, a liberal councillor and was responsible for pulling the money together to build the swimming bars on the King George's playing field. But of course he went back a very long time into the 1950s in supporting the Liberal Association. And here is Robin Day, the Grand Inquisitor, later known as Sir Robin Day, and the man largely responsible for uh, putting in the dustbin deference to politicians. <laughs> 
famously, in fact, um, had one politician storm off um, a, a meeting with him on BBC, I remember. But Derek said, um, when Robin Day was the candidate here, and incidentally, later in his life, of course, Robin Day was uh, not very anxious to get people to know of his association as a Liberal candidate. Um, but when he was here, the one thing he feared more than anything else was actually going out into the sticks, particularly up when Michael Chichesti, Craswell and all the rest of it. Because he said the trouble out there was all the farmers had nothing better to do in the evenings than listen to the radio, and they were all very clued up politically. And if he went to a village meeting, they always gave him a damned hard time. So how would... Where, <laughs> where would um... Good story. Could be anywhere. That could be anywhere, actually, yeah. Yeah, doesn't it? You know. Yeah. Um, so but again, he's got that decisive moment with the finger in the air. Yes, there were some other pictures Derek took of Sir Robin Day, or Robin Day as he was then, actually just sitting on the table in the um, uh, in the Liberal Association headquarters. They're very graphic, uh, very strongly lit pictures. Um, but Derek was very fond of Robin Day, and in fact, many years after um, he, he was a candidate here, they used to meet at the Liberal Club in in London. Uh, this is, I think, nineteen fifty seven or nineteen fifty nine. I think it is. Vote for Day, the only way to get a progressive MP for Hereford. Did he win? No, no, no. He followed on from uh, Frank Owen, who was the ex-editor of the Daily Mail or something. It was a very good candidate, but uh, no, they didn't. In the days of sort of news gathering and that, can you tell us a little bit about the catching the train and putting the rushes on the train? What, about Getting that? rid of the news was always the problem. Uh, and of course, the later in the day it was, the more acute became the problem. If you were working for TWW or later HTV or Central Television, you then had to get your film, which is inevitably a hundred foot spool of film, into the laboratories by about half past four in the afternoon because it had to be processed and, and edited, ready for transmission for the six o'clock news. And that was always a problem, but you were always up against time. I seem to remember there was a train to Birmingham New Street, probably from Hereford, that was appropriate to the, to the problem at about one o'clock in, um, in the afternoon. If you missed the train, uh, then you would occasionally ask the picture editor, could you drive the film into the studio? He was reluctant to do it because you were going to charge him uh, extra money to do it. But nevertheless, it, it was important that, in, that obviously the film got there on time. And the other thing that we did have was we used to purchase from British Rail some newspaper stamps, and they were big stamps. And we used to buy £70 worth at a time, I think they were. So you would have your film, if you were lucky, you were dashing down to the railway station for one o'clock, you'd put it in an envelope, you'd put a couple of these um, uh, stamps on it, and that would go straight through to New Street. You would then telephone the news desk at the other end and say it'll be at New Street at three o'clock or whatever it was, and hope to goodness it arrived there. It did rely on the goodwill, to be honest, of the British Rail staff. And at Hereford, they were particularly good. And in fact, if the train was there at three, going at one o'clock, and you dashed into the parcel office at two minutes to one, and you didn't have time to get it stamped, Mr. Pugh, I think the man's name was, or somebody used to say, oh, go on, get on through, and all the rest of it. And you would just dash out, and you would find the guard and hand him the material. There were other occasions where, of course, you just couldn't possibly meet the deadline without driving in the, um, into the studio. And I remember Derek and I were at Abercrombie near Reader one day uh, filming the section of the RAC rally. And we were there from about seven in the morning till about three in the afternoon in torrential rain. And then we had to sit in the car, soaked through, drive down to Cardiff and hand in the film and hope that it was going to be ready for the evening. The other way, of course, it was done for the newspaper industry in particular was uh, they would have to wire a picture. Uh, and what would happen is um, you would do a, a, a photographic print of about seven by five inches on a ten by eight piece of paper and it would be put on a rotating drum and scanned and sent up to wherever it was. Um, when Dr Parker was murdered here in Hereford, um, uh, the Daily Express, I think it was, sent a wire team in from London to actually wire a picture of the constable standing outside the, um, uh, the doctor's surgery. And I remember the men, they were particularly peaked because they'd actually been pulled off um, 
a, a boxing match in uh, London, which they particularly wanted to open, and they'd been sent down to Hereford just to send this one picture of a fellow standing outside a, a doctor's surgery. But of course, it, 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 in those days, um, you had to hire a dedicated line from the Hereford GPO station up to the uh, receiving site. And it was very expensive. In those days, I think it was something like £70 to, to transmit a picture, which was a huge amount of money. Okay, comes so right. tell us a little bit about the other fan disaster and how we managed to get really good access to other people. And well, of course, the Aberfan disaster was, was unbelievable. It was uh, well over a hundred children who died in a slurry of coal that came down from the uh, in a landslip from behind the school, didn't it? Went through the school, and uh, of course, such a tragedy would would inevitably attract the the world's media there. And Derek went down there for two or three days. Um, but as the men, of course, dug and, and the situation became more and more hopeless, I suspect tempers became more and more afraid. Um, the behaviour of some of the continental press who would come into this village and be gone in a few days uh, was a little bit um, less than uh, respectable, I suppose, uh, or respectful. And um, at some point, the tiny... Um, coffins, I believe, of the uh, of the victims were put into a chapel down there, and the Paris match photographers, I think it was, or freelance French fr freelance photographers, tried to get into there to photograph this, and of course it upset the miners tremendously, and there was a lot of hostility then to anybody who carried a camera, but unusually not to Derek, and Derek, of course, was the son of a Welsh miner, and perhaps there was some unknown link between them that they immediately thought well here's a kindred spirit and he's all right and um, and Derek carried on working. So tell us about Derek's love of jazz then and people that he photographed famous people. Derek did have a great love of jazz um, and of course um, he would go to various regional centres like Bristol Colston Hall, Birmingham Town Hall, when the big American bands would come over here. I think he even photographed one or two of them actually in the Shire Hall in Hereford. But there were one or two um, wonderful pictures actually from the 1950s. And they were wonderful because um, taking pictures then in very low light was very difficult. And Derek was working with quite slow films, again, probably HP5, which or HP4, HP3, which would have been 200, 400, 600 ASA at the most if he pushed it. So it was a skill to work in low light. And again, it was this same problem that you would wait for a high point of somebody lifting a hand, perhaps if they were conducting or just lifting their head and then using it in conjunction with the, with the lights that were coming down. Uh, very skilled work for its time, very skilled. Didn't always finish, of course, when you took the picture because inevitably you would have to go back to the dark room and you would then have to decide, do I overdevelop this um, uh, film or was my exposure correct? And if I don't overdevelop it, will I get enough shadow detail? So again, it was a question of judgment, to be honest. I did go once or twice with Derek to Birmingham Town Hall and believe me, there's not a lot of light there. And we went when films were a lot faster and it was very difficult to work, it was very difficult. What about his um, sort of personal love of jazz? Didn't he used to have a little jazz? Yes, he, well, late in life, Derek used to go to Nice, actually, to the, um, um, to the jazz festival down there and told me, this is just a few years ago, um, he was photographing a band there, I can't remember which it was, and he recognised a drummer that he'd known from the 50s, walked over to the fellow and said, I remember photographing you in the 1950s. And the fellow said, I remember you doing it at, the, at Bristol Colston Hall. And of course, that was 50 years or so later. <laughs>